reading is from Philippians 2 from verse 1 to 11 so if there's any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love any participation in the spirit any affection and sympathy complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love being in full accord and of one mind do nothing from rivalry or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, let us pray. Dear Lord, as we remember this week, starting with today, Palm Sunday, Jesus humbly rode on a colt through Jerusalem. And then we look forward to towards Good Friday, the time when Jesus would die on the cross of Calvary, because he loved us so much. Thank you, Lord, for your overwhelming love for us that enabled you to go through the plan of God the Father. Let us remember today that what has been prophesied in Isaiah 53, verse 7, you fulfilled in obedience to your Father God. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep, before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. It was fulfilled by Christ in Mark 15 verse 5, but Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Lord God, Heavenly Father, In your fatherly grace you did not spare your only son, but gave him up to death on the cross. Pour your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may find our highest comfort in your grace. Protect us from temptations to sin more, and help us patiently bear whatever hardships may come, so that through him we may have eternal life. Father God, thank you that Jesus came humbly, riding on a donkey, proclaiming peace. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and peace in our times. Make us instruments of your peace and guide us in the ministry of reconciliation. Our hearts bring loved ones to mind who have yet to acknowledge Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for their sins. May they find peace in you as we have in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, verses 5 to 11 of our text, which I hope is before you in Philippians chapter 2. Do keep your Bibles open or your tablets or your phones. That will be a great help as we work through our text this morning, as we continue our Easter series on the power of the cross. Those verses 5 to 11 are thought by some scholars to to have been something of an early Christian hymn that might have been sung by the early church. Now, we can't be certain of that, but what it does do is it brings together one of the most important paradoxes of the Christian faith, humiliation and exaltation. We saw in that Palm Sunday reflection from Etienne, there was a great irony in the crowd shouting Hosanna as Jesus entered, and yet just a few days later shouting crucify him. But here we have a paradox, an apparent contradiction. As one writer says, the Christian life is full of opposites that seem to contradict themselves. We must die to self if we would live for Christ. We must declare spiritual bankruptcy if we would be rich. We must mourn if we would be happy. We must hunger if we would be satisfied. We must lose our life if we would save it. But if we save our life, we will lose it. We must humble ourselves if we are to be exalted, according to our scripture this morning. The way up is down. It is the cross road and then glory. The way to exaltation is through humiliation. The mark of the true disciple of Jesus, according to our text this morning, is a sacrificial humbling of oneself for the sake of others. And that often comes at a cost. I wonder if, like me, sometimes you wish that following Jesus wasn't so hard. It is tough, isn't it, dear friends? Sometimes it means a a literal humiliation at the hands of those who hate our Saviour, who shout in their way, crucify him. Sometimes it's just the mere difficulty of sustaining a consistent, selfless pattern of living to those around you. But we've seen in our Easter series so far the wonderful power of the cross. We've seen its power where we began the series over evil. We've seen its power over self-righteousness. That's that self-exaltation, thinking that I can make my way to God through my own good works and religious acts. The power of the cross destroys that. We've seen the power of the cross last week with Tim to preserve and protect us eternally through our superior priest and sacrifice. And this Palm Sunday, my prayer is that you will know the power of the cross, not just in suffering or through it, but the power of the cross to suffer. The power of the cross to suffer. So let's uh, pray and I'll give you the two headings of where we're going this morning. Our Father, as the psalmist says at the end of Psalm 19, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. We've been framing these points in this Lenten period as a time of Uh, consideration and meditation and pondering and just examining our own hearts and so once more I want to frame it in the in the shape of things we should pray and I hope as a result of this we would indeed be moved to pray these things from our passage firstly I hope you'll be encouraged as a result of this text to pray that we would serve one another with the mind and the manner of Christ pray that we would serve one another with the mind and the manner of Christ And secondly, pray that we would soak ourselves in the finished work of Christ. That we would soak ourselves in the finished work of Christ. Have a look at verse 5 for a moment. It's the hinge of our text in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves. We ought to ask what mind? are we to have? What does that look like? What transformed way of thinking comes to us as a result of being in Christ that we are to put into practice? We'll pray that
that we would serve one another with the mind and the manner of Christ. And so what that verse in the middle of our text does is it points us back, and of course it points us forward, which we'll come to under our second point. So let's go just a little further back into Philippians chapter 1 and read there from verse 27. And we'll read into chapter 2 again. Paul says in Philippians 1.27, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation... Thank you. <laughs> Thought it might be causing interference. It's always unnerving when somebody sneaks up behind you. <laughs> Any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to, the interests, to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves. Here is a picture friends, of the normal Christian life. A life, as Paul puts it, living worthy of the gospel. In fact, literally, those verses say that you would be citizens of a word, be living worthily, as worthy citizens of the gospel. I read this story this past week online of a British couple that thought they had won 205 million euros in a lottery. Now just imagine if that was you. If you thought that was happening and the payout was to come soon, what would you be doing? Well, your whole life, I reckon, would start to be planned differently. You would imagine what could be, what you could get, what, what debts you might repay, what things you might change, what houses you might buy, whatever it is, what holiday you could go on. You would start planning a whole different life, wouldn't you? But in a twist of fate that seems straight out of Hollywood drama, this British couple experienced the ultimate roller coaster of emotions, going from believing they had won a life changing 205 million euros to the stark realization that they would never see a penny of it. Imagine coming to that point. The crushing blow was delivered when they reached out to the lottery officials to claim their windfall. And they were informed that their ticket was invalid because the automatic purchase through the Euro Millions app had not been processed. The reason? Their bank account was insufficiently funded. And as a result, the payment for the ticket could not go through. What an irony. Imagine. All you'd planned and thought this new life you could begin was so different. And now it all comes crashing down. The Philippians might have been tempted because Philippi was a Roman colony, that they had everything they needed because Roman citizenship came with great privilege. It's wonderful. But now as Paul reminds them, being in Christ, they have more than 205 million euros. They have this great wealth of treasure, this wonder in him. And because of all he is and all he has done, it's all they need. They don't need the perks of Roman citizenship, whatever that would bring them. They don't need the things of this life in abundance. They have Jesus. And out of that, that citizenship in Christ, in the heavenly places, that new citizenship which they have, they are to live or walk worthily of that. Their bank accounts are not empty. They have been given true wealth, being made citizens of God's kingdom. And their allegiance to Jesus and his kingdom dictates now the shape of their new lives. It is forever changed. But what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, I want you to notice two main things here in this normal Christian life. Firstly, that this Christian life is characterized by opposition. By opposition. 
One thing is crystal clear in the New Testament, dear friends, is that faithful disciples of Jesus will suffer. They will find rejection as you take your stand for Christ. Don't be surprised by it. Yes, here for a time, until His glorious return, the world will ridicule, humiliate, and seek to bring down Christ's followers. It is to be expected. It is normal. But more than that, Paul actually says in verse 29 of chapter 1 that it's been granted to you to suffer. It's gifted to you. And that's a bit hard for us to swallow, isn't it? But what he's saying here is that it's part of the privilege of walking with him to suffer for him. And it stands out as a mark that you truly belong to him. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Not the opposite. We do need to pray about this, don't we? Because our world is wired and our hearts are wired to constantly flee from trouble towards comfort, don't we? That's what we want. We want the easy life. We want the quiet life. We want people just to leave us in peace. But that's not the way of the cross. To have the mind of Christ is to accept this path of suffering as He did. And we should not expect anything less. And we should, in fact, embrace the privilege of being counted worthy to suffer for His name. You know that, don't you? When you boldly open your mouth about Jesus, it comes, doesn't it? The ridicule. Maybe they say it behind their back. Maybe they're polite to your face. But it comes. When you're full of integrity in your workplace and all around you is seeking to make a quick buck through dishonest means, the pressure comes, doesn't it? It comes. Suffering will come. It comes to us here, yes. It comes to our brothers and sisters across the world and Jacques posts regular updates of the persecuted church on our prayer chain. Oh, please, friends, be on your knees for them as they face their very lives on the line. Many die for the name of Christ. It is normal Christian living. But you're not meant to fight this war alone. We fight side by side, literally standing shoulder to shoulder, as Paul says in chapter 1. We have each other's backs. We should. Like suffering for him, he doesn't speak of it as an optional extra, but an absolute necessity of the worthy Christian life. The Christian life is not just one of opposition, it is one of one anotherness. One anotherness. Christianity is never a matter, friends, of me and Jesus and my own private faith. No, it's a profound oneness together with his people and a one anotherness serving each other that is brought about by the gospel. And so Paul goes on to underline the one anotherness of this Christian walk. Maybe again as he writes these verses here, he has Euodia and Syntyche in mind, the two women in the church in chapter 4 we're told, who are at each other's throats in conflict with one another over non-gospel issues. And Paul is saying, don't, get your act together, there's so much at stake. Why are you fighting over these non-issues? Stand together in the gospel. It does harm when Christians fight over things that don't matter. There are bigger battles to fight. Stand together. I can't remember where this illustration uh, came from, but many years ago it stuck in my head. I think it was Charles Swindle who reminded us that those soldiers, if you've been to war, maybe you know this, the soldiers who are on the front line, engaged with front line battle, don't have time to argue and grumble with each other. They're engaged with the enemy. But it's those at the back who are complaining of the conditions and the lack of food. We're front line soldiers and we fight on our knees. But we fight on our knees. We fight together, unified. So what do we need for that fight? What attitude sustains that, that unity and that serving of one another in the midst of this battle? An attitude like Christ's. And in one word, in our text, humility. Humility. Examine your hearts as we go through this, as we look at what this one anotherness is characterized by. And ask yourself, is, is that me? Am I, am I just a humble servant of Christ? Have a look again, verse 1. 
If there is any encouragement in Christ, this is chapter 2, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Dear friends, at the heart of healthy church relationships is humility, loving humility. In his excellent little book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, Tim Keller reflects this about C.S. Lewis. He says, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity makes a brilliant observation about gospel humility at the very end of his chapter on pride. If we were to meet a truly humble person, Lewis says, we would never come away from meeting them thinking they were humble. They would not be always telling us they were a nobody because a person who keeps saying they are a nobody is actually a self-obsessed person. The thing we would remember from meeting the, a, a truly gospel humble person is how much they seemed to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. Gospel humility is not needing to think about myself not needing to connect things with myself. It is an end to such thoughts as, I'm in this room with these people. Does that make me look good? Do I want to be here? True gospel humility means I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. In fact, I stop thinking about myself. The freedom of self-forgetfulness, the blessed rest that only self-forgetfulness brings. You see why we need to pray this? Because pride rises in our hearts all the time. Or is it just me? See, humility doesn't come naturally. Remember the former principal of our George Whitfield College saying this, that he reckoned that the greatest enemy to the church as he was preaching in Acts was an independent mindset independence and perhaps not the answer you would expect but what's behind that the mother of all sins as augustine called it pride it's all about me independence self-sufficiency is a great enemy to the church to community and that's why we need to pray because we're constantly bombarding with worldly thinking that's even in the church there's such a self-centered christianity in the church sadly that it's all about you we're constantly battle, battered by, you know, this Nemo seagull philosophy. What are the Nemo seagulls saying all the time? Exactly. Comes so naturally. I identify with it. Comes naturally to my children. Mine, mine, mine. And that squeezes the life out of true community. It squeezes the life out of my generosity, my time my sacrifice, my priorities. And so I really need to pray for the priorities of Jesus. And according to Scripture, not just here, but throughout the New Testament, one of Jesus' priorities is the church. He laid himself on the line for the church. Not for just little individuals here and there, but for community, for you and me. So ask yourself, dear friend, how precious how precious is God's family to you? Do you see yourself as having their back? Do you see yourself as responsible for their very lives? That can't just happen by pitching up once on a Sunday, every now and then. Can it? Now, if we're going to do that with Christ-like humility, then our eyes must be constantly set on Him. Our triune God. We said it in the Athanasian Creed, or part of the Athanasian Creed. It's a magnificent creed. Go and read all of it. It'll take you about an hour, but it's wonderful. Our God is in community, in perfect love, in a sense, in Himself. He's created community. He's sprung it to being through His Son, but if we are going to do this with Christ-like humility, if we're going to fight this battle of the cross through suffering and pain and struggle, 
then our eyes need to be constantly set on him. So pray, secondly and lastly, that we would soak ourselves in the finished work of Christ. It's there, hinted at already in verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy. He's prefaced it already, this attitude we ought to have, by focusing our eyes on Christ. And then, of course, he does it magnificently in this hymn. Verse 5, let me read again. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You read this, you soak this in, you cannot come away with a self-centered Christianity. It's not about your glory, it's about His. But guess what? The wonderful thing is those who humble themselves under Him will be exalted by Him. It's a wonderful truth. But what Paul reminds us here, as we soak ourselves in the finished work of Christ, is it is by grace we come to faith in the first place, but it is by grace that we go on in faith. We never move on from the gospel. So first, we are reminded here that to have this very ability to live and love differently, this humble way given to us is given in Christ. The Christ who is the encourager, that word there means alongside you, whose love is in you, whose affections grow in you. And by the help of His Spirit, that's how we become changed and transformed. His death becomes the very thing that not only saves, but enables us to live a sanctified life that transforms us from the inside out. Again, this is uh, Tim Keller in his little book. And he says, Do you realize that it is only in the gospel of Jesus Christ that you get the verdict before the performance? Just take that in. The atheists might say that they get their self-image from being a good person. They're a good person and they hope that eventually they'll get the verdict that confirms that they are a good person. Performance leads to verdict. For the Buddhist, too, performance leads to the verdict. If you're a Muslim, performance leads to the verdict. All this means that every day you're in the courtroom, every day you're on trial. That is the problem. But Paul is saying that in Christianity, the verdict leads to the performance. You see, the verdict is in. The judgment has been pronounced for the believer on the cross. There is no condemnation in Christ. He, the fully righteous one, fully man, fully God, has paid the price. And all those who have trusted Him are granted a righteousness in Christ. The verdict is in. You're made clean. You're forgiven. The judge has ruled not guilty. The verdict is in. And the result of that is response of faith and obedience. You see, the verdict is in. And now I perform on the basis of the verdict because He loves me and accepts me. I do not have to do things just to build up my resume. I do not have to do things to make me look good. I can do things for the joy of doing them. I can help people to help people. Not so that I can feel better about myself. Not so I can fill up the emptiness, but just because He has loved me so wondrously. That phrase in the song just keeps coming back to me, one of Roxy and I's favorite songs by 10th Avenue North, called The Struggle. Hallelujah. We are free to struggle. We're not struggling to be free. It's good news, isn't it? And we live from approval, not for approval. From the approval of God and His Son who delights in his children and will never stop delighting in them, sinners though we are. So just take in again the remarkable humility of Christ our Saviour in these verses. It's a magnificent mystery. In verses 6 and 7, when it talks about he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
It expresses this truth. He did not use his equality with God as something to be used for his own gain. Or to use one translation, to be deployed for his own advantage. Instead, he used his Godhead for the advantage of mankind, for you and me. That phrase, he emptied himself, underlines that again. It doesn't mean he emptied himself of something. He didn't empty himself of his deity, his godness. It means something like this. He gave up his rights to become a nobody, to become a slave. A slave had no rights. And he became one for you and for me. It's astonishing. We are not used to power being used that way. We're used to it being used just the opposite for selfish gain. That we can barely comprehend what Christ has done. Imagine all the power in the universe and it's for your good and mine. Why? Verse 8. Here's the purpose. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The people on that Palm Sunday were shouting, Hosanna. They were ready to crown a king. And Jesus knew what was to come a week later. And even though that same crowd was shouting, crucify him, it was part of the plan. It was the purpose. It was what God had sent his son to do. He'd sent him to die for you and me. An ultimate sacrifice was the ultimate purpose. Ultimate humility pictured ultimately all for your sake. Or Don Carson perhaps puts it more eloquently than I have just put it. Unqualified divine majesty unites with the immeasurable divine self-sacrifice. Unqualified divine majesty unites with the immeasurable divine self-sacrifice. Dear friends, all for you. He was slandered for you. He was rejected for you. He was betrayed for you. He was tortured for you. He was beaten and torn for you. He was slaughtered for you. He was murdered for you. All that for you. Such remarkable humility and humiliation. How can we not ponder that and not be changed? How can we come away from pondering that and think life is about me? How can we come away with a fear that thinking if I pour myself out, I'm going to get hurt? He has spared you the greatest hurt, the hurt of hell. The judgment of his father. Should we not go into the breach and lay our lives down in love for others? Time is short. This matters. It's an urgency. And to do so with all the power he gives. We can suffer, yes. But we suffer with hope. For he has not despised our souls. And there is more. More to come. Yes, we may face humiliation for his name's sake here. Yeah. Yes, we may be called to hard self-sacrifice and humility. That is the way that is normal Christian living. But it doesn't stop there. There is one more outstanding truth from the section that has to do with the son's vindication, having fulfilled his mission, that fuels the Christian life's perseverance in the midst of the struggle. Verse 9 again. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think about this. I think about the quarrels I've had with brothers and sisters in Christ over non-essentials, non-issues. I think about my heart and where I fail to love where I should. I think about the times I should have and I didn't. I think about the times I've been lazy in my Christian walk. I think about the times I know I've fallen short. I think about the times I've ignored my sin and not confessed it. I think about the times I've hidden. I think about the times I've stumbled and gone so sloth-like in my Christian walk. I think about the times I've lost sight of heaven. And I wonder what I would say before this glorious majesty when I stand in Jesus' court. But God, they did that to me. Well, God, it was hard, you know that. There'll be no pleading, will there be? There'll be no excuses. It wouldn't matter. And even if I tried, he would rise up in my defense and say, you are mine. 
It's okay. I paid for that. It's done. You're mine. Welcome. And welcome to the family. It's much bigger than you thought, isn't it? You didn't expect that person to be here, did you? But oh, look. Look at this family. You look around here and you think, well, this is family. Didn't expect that. But how glorious it is. Because the father, with the son accomplishing his mission, raised him from the dead, ascended him to heaven, is now seated at the right hand, interceding for you, pleading your case. She is mine, he is mine, they belong to me, always, forever. Don't abandon them, Father, they're mine. God exalted his son, raised him, to whom one day all must bow, whether willingly or unwillingly. Jesus has the last word, all opposition vanquished. It's worth it, dear friend, to suffer this little time here while we wait for our own exaltation to be with him forever. To walk in a manner worthy of Christ is to imitate Christ's utter humility amidst suffering and to anticipate exaltation from the Father ourselves one day. The Father will exalt those who have humbled themselves. And there is no greater exaltation to expect, is there? We might even say that this world is divided into two kinds of people, those trying to exalt themselves by any means possible and those who are waiting for the exaltation of the Father on that day. So as you seek to live out the gospel, keep your eyes fixed on him. Us, we, keep our eyes fixed on him. For he not only provides the power in the gospel, but also the pattern in the gospel for worthy living. We are in every way to be like our Savior, except one. We don't walk a cross road that leads to a sin-bearing death. He has done that. He has paid the penalty. We take up our cross knowing our debt is paid. The verdict is in. The burden is lifted. The condemnation is passed from us. And glory, sweet glory, is to come. Isn't that good news? Isn't God good? In a moment, we are going to sing a song that I asked the band to do. It's, uh, as I mentioned, a new song. But it's based on a theme of an old song that I want to just finish with this. You want examples of how this is lived out apart from our glorious example of Christ? Look at Paul's own example. His longing for glory and yet desiring to live for Christ with all his heart there in prison for Jesus. You want to read the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus immediately after this? Different positions, if you like, in gospel ministry, but both gospel ministers and soldiers, Epaphroditus pouring himself out even to almost to, to his own death. But I want to read you one more example, and this has been something we've been doing in this series, referencing a well-known hymn, and I'm sure you'll get which one this is, but we're not going to sing that hymn, we're going to sing a newer version that's slightly different as we close. But here's an example of a man by the name of Joseph Scriven. Tragedy haunted the footsteps of Joseph Scriven with dogged persistence. Following his graduation from the University of Dublin, Ireland with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1842, his 23rd year, he fled his native Irish shores after the tragic drowning of his fiancée on the evening prior to their scheduled marriage. But he found little solace in flight, although he put thousands of miles between himself and the familiar sights and smells of Dublin. He fled off to Canada. And then later in Canada, we read this, late one night in 1855, weighed down with loneliness and overcome with despondency and sadness, he poured out his heart to God, begging for relief from his burden and promising to serve him faithfully. If only his prayer were answered. God heard and answered and Joseph Scriven felt the burden miraculously lifted from his heart. In his newfound joy, he hurriedly dashed off a very simple poem of several stanzas in which he described his struggle and victory. The poem entitled, Pray Without Ceasing, began with these lines. 
What a friend we have in Jesus. We have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You know the song, don't you? It's going in your mind right now. It comes out of great struggle and suffering. It doesn't end there. Falling in love for the second time, he became engaged to Miss Eliza Catherine Roche, only daughter of Lieutenant Andrew Roche of the Royal Navy. However, she contracted tuberculosis and died in 1860 before their wedding could take place. A second time. But following such tragic blows, he gave himself all the more diligently to religious and philanthropic work. He endeared himself to the people in and around Butley because of his Christ-like life and his habit of giving away all his private income to the poor, whom he considered in more urgent need than himself. In later years, he was, was described as a man of short stature with iron gray hair, close cropped beard, and light blue eyes that sparkled when he talked. Someone else said he had the face of an angel, while another who knew him well spoke of his habit of preaching to everyone about the love of Jesus, as well as the peculiarities that marked his declining years. In the midst of great suffering, he was enabled by Christ, even through that suffering, because of the power of the cross, of his friend, Jesus, to keep shining through those blue eyes the love of Jesus. Will we do the same? Especially this Easter time. Will you join me as we sing? Let's ask the band to come up. And we'll sing together that new song. I have a friend, a faithful friend. And then we will pray the collect for Palm Sunday at the end of our service together, which sets the theme and has set the theme for our Easter series. Let's stand, let's sing.